Good morning and welcome this Friday morning to Breakfast Central. We thank you for starting the week with us and wrapping the week up with us. We have some of our big stories that we've been following all through the week that we'll be looking at this morning. I am Olive M.O.D. And I am Usaogi Ogboma. Thank you for joining us. Uh, to our viewers who are watching us online also, we appreciate your time this morning. And also, um, it's been a very interesting week, mostly centered around the celebration of Nigeria's Democracy Day and, of course, the fallout you know, from... Uh, that event. There's so many of these conversations that have happened this week, including, of course, you know, conversations with the uh, Nigerian Labour Congress and also bits and pieces of the drama in River State. But of course, it's been a very interesting week across current affairs here in Nigeria. We'll be sharing with you what our uh, top stories are in a bit, but let's first of all say good morning to Judith Atibi, who's joining us um, well, with Breakfast Headlines. We'll uh, join her in a, in a second. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it's it, it's been a very interesting week. You yes, know, it and, has. Um, um, Tuesday, we celebrated Nigeria's uh, Democracy Day. Um, unfortunately, like I mentioned yesterday, it did come with controversy that eventually just swamped the whole conversation. And, you know, we barely then had time to talk about actual democracy and where we are with you know, Nigeria's democracy. Um, the, pres the incident with uh, Mr. President, of course, you know, took over the whole conversation. Um, along with, of course, the um, uh, portraits. portraits. Yes, yes, you know, of Mr. President. That's going to be my top story for the week. Um, but that basically took over the whole conversation. And, you know, I, I pointed out yesterday that the reason that it was so easy for that to overshadow the Democracy Day conversation is because there really wasn't so much, you know, that the current administration was going to express as, you know, our wins with regards, you know, democracy. Um, in 25 years, you know, it's not so much that Nigeria can boast of, you know. I, I mean, there's it's a lot to celebrate that we've been able to maintain the democracy for this long and keep it going. Um, there's arguments that we can continue to fine-tune it, you know, it's still a work in progress, there's still so much, you know, but just like um, um, Badibol um, Rose Viva said, 25 years is enough time for you to have learned, is enough time for you to have understood what you want from democracy. There are too many examples, you know, for the Nigeria to also look at and learn, you know, about democracy from, you know, we don't have to wait till it's 100 years old before we can say, okay, yes, we have a successful democracy. So are we managing our democracy well enough? The, the tenets of democracy that, you know, every country should have, does Nigeria have it? Free and fair elections, you know, the um, 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 existence of a civil society, the existence of, you know, proper opposition, you know, in government, and some of all of that. A judicial system, or rather the three tiers of government being fully existent. We struggle with some of all those things, and, you know, there's, there's just not a lot of it that we should, you know, say that we are super proud of. Um, with regards to our democracy. Absolutely. I mean, if I also refer to the interview we had with Deji Adeyong, where he said that the president might have staged his fall, whilst I do not believe that his president staged his fall. But I, I, I can see why statements like that will be made in the first place, because we saw what happened on the 29th of May, all the conversation on the 29th of May that should have shown what the current administration has achieved in the past one year in office was then centered around the national anthem. Yeah. So this looked like some form of a smokescreen to distract from the fact that we really didn't have actual content. The president's speech, I applaud um, the fact that he made reference or he gave an ode to the fathers of democracy in Nigeria and those who have been a very key part of the journey to the democratic, uh, to the democracy that we have. Even though I feel like some of them will be, they will be grinding their teeth when they see, they would ask themselves sometimes, this democracy that I fought for, what that I sacrificed myself for. Um, I do, however, think that a lot of emphasis needs to be placed on the rule of law, the application of the rule of law in this past one year, in this current administration. How well are they, because when you say democracy is uh, government of the people, for the people, and by the people, the people have to agree. The people have agreed, yes, we have a system of government, but c can we guarantee that the, all the other arms of government that come together to form the current system of government that we have, that all these other arms of government are doing what they ought to do? Can we trust in the independence of the judiciary? Can we trust that when we go to the judiciary, the judiciary is the last hope of the common man. We've seen the role that the judiciary played in the 2023 elections. We still have cases that have spilled over even up yep. until 2024. So there's just so many areas to look at when we see our democracy. But there are things to be thankful for. We haven't been torn apart as a nation, even, the, even though there are many people who would advocate that that might be a better option. But yep. if they went back to have conversations with their parents and they saw what the war did to them, yeah. I had 
stories that my grandmother shared with me about how the war was, it was terrible. I'm not sure that we want to, be, we want to witness another war in our lifetime. But it's not, you know, I mean, so, talking about war is maybe even taking it too far. Oh, there are even people as, who say that, let's cut everything and start all over again, well, right? We, we, we see a lot of that. So for me, it's just saying, I, I think that the silver lining here is the fact that we're still united as a country. We're not, we're not being torn apart. Yes, there are pockets of war in different parts. I'm not going to downplay what is happening in southern Kaduna and other parts of the country, right? But that we still have this entity called Nigeria is something that, uh, you know, we're great, grateful for. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there, there, there's that. Um, but, but maybe that is also alluding to the possibility you know that we had major reasons to break apart in the last 20 years which you know there, there really isn't i mean you there's think been there agitations. isn't no oh, not no. really there's many people there are many for... who would disagree with you that they have the major reasons if not we would I, not be I having mean, the sit at home order every monday so i mean there's there's the agitation no doubt you know but aside that agitation you know by the ipob there's not a lot of conversations across Nigeria that say, oh, you know, maybe we should break apart. It's just... They like, even blame the amalgamation that happened. Now, my, point, my point is, you know, the general conversation across the country, um, not to a large percentage, would you say that there's been a lot of people who have been pushing for us to break apart? Aside the IPOB, um, Sunday Igbo holds, you know, a, agitation only lasted on, for a couple on of weeks. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. There's, right. there's not been a lot of that. Um, I'm more concerned, you know, about the fact that we, you know, have been in a democracy that long, but there's still a very strong militarization of our mentality as a people. We still have a you know, strong militarization of our, our lives. Exactly. As a it's people. not just our you know, mentality, it's, not, it's yeah. also it's our systems, the systems but it starts by which we go. The mentality is what allows it to mm -hmm. exist and allow, allows it to thrive. We still have you, that. You mean mentality. the mentality of the, of the citizens or the mentality of the leaders? Both. 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 Okay. All right. Um, we'll continue to talk more about our democracy here on Breakfast Central and of course we'll be heading to our breakfast headlines shortly but let's share with you the top stories for this morning. Federal government threatens mass sacking as Labour disowns agreement and the feud continues between the tripartite organisation. Also this morning, the National Association of Nigerian Students rejects single six-year anti-democratic bill. They call it. And the month of June is Men's Health, Men's Health Month. We're going to be celebrating Men's Health Month, looking at what that means. Also, Supreme Court reserves ruling in local government autonomy suit. And uh, away from that, we'll be reviewing the newspaper front pages and opening the phone line so you can call in. All these and more on Breakfast Central. Now, Juliet brings you breakfast headlines. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. And just as we get into it, let's first of all bring you breakfast headlines with Judith TV. Thank you so much, sir. Let's begin headlines this morning in West Africa, Nigeria, where President Bola Tinubu on Friday received a draft bill seeking a return to a regional system of government for Nigeria. The proposed legislation, authored by a chieftain of the Yoruba Social Cultural Association, Afenifere Aki Fakbounda, seeks, among others, new extent laws to be cited as the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria New Governance Model for Nigeria Act 2024. The Court of Appeal has set aside contempt proceedings initiated by the former governor of Kogi State, Yahaya Bello, against the chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Ola Nikwekun Olukoyede, in a unanimous judgment read by Justice Joseph Oyewole. He set aside the proceedings while overruling the respondent's preliminary uh, objection citing technicalities. The appeal court held that the trial judge failed to extend the orders of 9th February in its final judgment of April 17th. In the meantime, we move now to Delta State, South South Nigeria, where the governor, Sheriff Uburiwiri, on Thursday pledged sustained partnership with the Nigerian military and other security agencies for effective security and social economic development of the state. Governor Buriwori, who was speaking while playing host to the general officer commanding GOC, the 6th Division of the Nigerian Army, Port Harcourt in Asaba, reiterated the state government's support for security agencies in the state. 
And more now, moving away from the south south of Nigeria, the federal government of Nigeria has advised organized labor to consider the broader economic implications of its push for what it called an unrealistic higher national minimum wage. Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, who gave the domination while speaking at the opening of the 2024 Synod of the Charismatic Bishops at Conference of Nigeria in Abuja, noted that the 250,000 Naira minimum wage demanded by labor could undermine the economy, lead to massive entrenchment of workers, and jeopardize the welfare of Nigerians. And we'll move now to South Africa, where a second person has died in South Africa this week from the viral infection Mpox, says the health ministry, less than 24 hours after it announced the first death. Now, previously known as monkeypox, mpox is a viral illness transmitted through close contact with infected humans or animals, as well as via materials such as contaminated sheets. In July 2022, the World Health Organization, WHO, declared a global health emergency, which lasted for 10 months. And now to Malawi, where its president, Lazarus Chakwara, has appealed to the international community to render its support in the investigations of the plane crash that claimed the lives of Vice President and eight others on Monday. Jaquara made this appeal on Thursday morning while, when he met with over 20 heads of missions and international agencies at Kamazu Palace in Malawi. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines is back to Lady Olive and uh, the gentleman also. All right, thank you very much. Very interesting stories there. Seeing the development to uh, the Yahya Bello um, 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 uh, court appearance, he apparently didn't show up yesterday um, in court. Um, and of course, this really is one case that Nigerians are keeping a keen eye on. They want to see how it goes. You know, will he show up? Will he be, you know, um, charged? Will he plead his case in court, just many, many things. And of course, the EFCC's promise. I remember that the EFCC chairman made a promise to Nigerians that, of course, he must follow through with the, uh, with the case. So we'll see how this one turns out. I mean, honestly, uh, at this point, the thing about, I mean, I, I remember your intro, the monologue between yourself, uh, or rather the banter between yourself and Olive. And one thing that you said that uh, was very, you know, very pertinent at this time is how you know the judiciary uh, arm of, of the government needs to uh, needs to be an entity in terms of autonomy when it comes to to power and you know just you know rulings in, in situations like this and time and time again we see this i mean efcc has made a promise can they fulfill on their promise can the conflicting orders that we continue to see when it comes to them delivering uh, their duty or delivering uh, their responsibilities or their jd is literally being done and you know there's no conflicting of order you know the the system is not sort of set up against it i don't know but one thing is for certain um if it must be done and done in a way where nigerians are tired you know and just being able to see the right thing done in terms of economic crimes and financial crimes and corruption such as this and allegations having their day and efcc has been able to do their jobs uh judiciary and the the entire system has to that's the final way for it to work together. It, Absolutely. It, I, I mean, point. the EFCC is also in a way on trial because everyone's watching with a keen eye to see how this matter will turn out because everybody just, saw, not everybody, but a number of people assumes, assumed that this would be one of those cases that have been swept under the carpet. Bear in mind that lately they haven't had the best reputation. We can see exactly how they handled what happened in Akure, how they uh, went into two clubs and arrested a number of people. They've come out to give a statement, but on social media they're being called out for how they have... Uh, treated people inhumanly, how they have stripped them of their fundamental human rights. So they say that uh, uh, social media users and Nigerians are saying that EFCC is very quick to pick on vulnerable Nigerians when it comes to those in power, that they are very, very slow with justice. So EFCC is on trial, the judiciary is on trial, Nigerians are watching. And honestly, I'm hoping that... Uh, you honestly, know, Olive, you put it so well. Uh, I, I remember I saw a tweet and this person was saying that when is the day going to come that you're going to parade 
you know, corrupt officials and, you know, officials of power in the same way that you do the common man? Like, yeah. when are you going to parade them the same way that you do, you know, uh, as, they, as, as we say, all animals are equal, but not all animals are equal. Yeah, absolutely. That parade, in fact, that's even another conversation, But because when, when we talk about the legality of parading suspects, that's something that has been kicked against, because by virtue of the Constitution, Section 36 sub 5 provides for their innocence. So you can't be parading them. There have been situations where innocent people have been parading paraded wrongfully and by the time their name is cleared unfortunately the information is out there their mock shots is out there so uh, there's so much like i said i think the best way to wrap it up is the world is watching the efcc and the judiciary and i'm hoping that this litmus test for justice will not into not in our nigerian times fall our hand judith we'll see you again at 9 a.m thank you so much for bringing us breakfast headlines thank you guys and uh, well done all right, all right. All right, uh, stay with us. Uh, we have, of course, you know, more of these conversations coming your way this morning. Uh, let's take a short break. When we come back, we continue with Breakfast Central. Welcome back. Nigeria's Apex Court has reserved judgment in the suit filed by the federal government against the 36 state governors seeking full autonomy for the 774 local government areas in the country. Justice Gaba Lawal announced that the judgment will be reserved after the seven-man panel overseeing the suit had adopted the processes filed by the Attorney General of the Federation on behalf of the federal government. Marvelous Obomano reports. Between Nigeria's federal government and state governments over the autonomy of the third tier of government also known as local government, has gathered national attention in recent times. Many Nigerians have accused governors of stifling the performance of local governments by refusing to hand over allocated funds paid into the coffers of their respective states. The same way Mr. President removed West subsidy, even when it was difficult for others to do, Mr. President had taken the bull by the horn to say, we will practice the true democratic process via the Constitution. We have three tiers of government. The local government system is the only system that would deepen democracy in the 774 local government. And we are saying, enough is enough. Enough of the high-handedness. Democracy should be brought to the grassroots, and the people of the grassroots should feed the dividends of democracy. This is the hope that Bola Metinubu promised Nigeria, and we are happy that he has brought this hope. No more dilidarying, no more going through the back door to stop this from happening. We believe our lords will do justice. Most of them are in contravention of Section 7 sub 1 of the Constitution, which says that the system of local government shall be run by democratically elected government. So this attitude of governors thinking that local government chairmen are there and their whims and caprices has to stop. I was elected as the governor, but he seizes allocation meant for me. He dissolves the council at will. So local government should not continue to be at the beck and call of the of the of the of the, of the state governors. If the president sees the allocation, they will make a high mount to that of it. As hearing of the suit continued, the federal government through the Attorney General of the Federation urged the Supreme Court to grant all reliefs it is seeking in its suit. However, the governors through their respective state attorneys generals oppose the request of the federal government. The Supreme Court have had the matter and uh, the position of the 36 AG, it, uh, we appeared in protest and uh, we await the outcome of uh, the decision of the Supreme Court. When the, when the judgment is read, you will know why we have appeared in protest. But like I said, the position of the 36 attorneys general is that we all appeared in protest. Although the Supreme Court has reserved ruling to a date that will be communicated to the parties, the 774 local government chairmen in Nigeria will be hoping that this judgment will be in their favor and they will take charge of their funding and deliver on their constitutional mandate to the people at the grassroots. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Oboman. Thank you very much, uh, Marvelous, for that. Uh, and Osage, I don't think that what the 
federal government is asking for is anything out of the ordinary. I, th I would think that what they're asking for is common sense because you would expect that the local government has the autonomy, should have autonomy. It doesn't currently have. If you're saying that there are local government of the 774 local governments in Nigeria that do not have duly elected local government uh, chairman or duly elected local government officers, they're being manned by a caretaker committee. They should not get the same um, allowance and the same allocation that they typically should have gotten from the federal government you know that's one on the other hand there's also the expectation that the money should go directly from the federal government to the local government because why exactly is the state government the one that is money in fact <laughs> we should really break down a lot of all these things state governors on the other hand will talk about when we are criticizing state governors for every month running cap in hand for federal allocation right now they they're then doing the same thing you know, to the, to the local government. Because some of them, the local government uh, chairman, don't even get, they don't get these funds. In some states, they would argue that they're not getting the full um, extent of the funds allocated to them because they, they've been politicized. Yeah, I mean, so the, 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 the situation is so bad that Nigerians don't even have conversations about local government elections. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, almost, it's almost a thing that doesn't happen, you know. And in many states, um, well, there are times in many states where um, local governments have been dissolved and I mean the idea of the local government leadership has been dissolved the state government then set up a caretaker committee and that's one of the things that the AGF you know has, has, has stated in his suit um, that you know these things must stop Nigerians barely even remember the existence or the relevance of the local government you know what Nigerians do is the federal and state um, and mostly because of the um, disregard of the Constitution, so, uh, Section 7 of the Constitution by state governors, where, of course, you know, they take charge, like you've said, even, you know, of the funds that are meant to be allocated to, you know, the local government. And we're talking about, you know, on the average, 150 to 250, maybe sometimes 300 million naira every month that is directed to the local government. Um, um, and this is for all 774 local governments, you know, across the country. Um, that has reduced the ability of these local government chairmen to actually do the work that must be done for their local government. Um, I agree also that there's been many instances where the funds do not get to the local government or the full um, allocation doesn't get to the local government. It gets to the state government. The state government then gives the local government what you know he thinks that they deserve every month or whatever they've agreed. But there's also the part where these local government chairmen, and we're talking about in situations where there's no caretaker committee now, there's actual local government chairman. A chairman. These local government chairmen basically understand their loyalty uh, to the state government, and so they also do not raise any objections. We've barely heard any, you know, instances where local government chairmen across the country, like if the Attorney General of Federation is not the one speaking on their behalf now, we've barely heard any situations where local government chairmen across the country, you know, um, canvass a change in what the situation is. They barely ever come together to say. We want our allocation to be sent to us so we can handle the affairs of How our local government. How dare you speak we, against that? Exactly. That so that doesn't even there. happen because they've also seen that as, as the norm. And it's also because of the rot in the political and electoral system where these people know that they are, their existence as local government chairman is not dependent on the people who voted them in as local government chairman, but the governor who allowed them be local government chairman. And the same thing almost in the state houses of assembly. Right. That's why the loyalties are to one person who allows them. So it's a complete mess. Absolute and I like mess. that the AGF is fighting this fight. And I hope that he, he gets he, to, Yeah, know, and if the governor's okay. hands were uh, are completely clean, they would not have fought against it. They would be open yeah. to the local government getting the money. And kudos to the actual governors or the actual states that do not interfere with the workings of the local government. I remember that when this came up, uh, Governor Babajide Songulu kicked against it's saying that oh they should they should have been clear and mentioned the states that Lagos State is not a part of it that Lagos State is as independent as it gets you know and and kudos to whichever governments or governors state governors are ensuring that they, they are, the local government are as autonomous as they should be now let's move on from that conversation to another the federal government on Wednesday cautioned organized labor against pushing for an unrealistic higher national minimum wage warning of potential economic fallout and mass retrenchment of workers. This warning comes after President Bola Tinubu's Democracy Day broadcast, where he claimed that an agreement had been reached on the new national minimum wage, a claim refuted by labor unions. The NLC has remained firm in their stance, rejecting the federal government and organized private sector's offer of 62,000 naira, as well as the state governor's maximum of 60,000 naira. The NLC criticized these offers as insufficient and not reflective 
of the current economic realities. While the government stressed, on the other hand, the importance of a realistic wage system that, that avoids uh, mass layoffs and economic uh, disruption. Uh, joining us uh, this morning is labor law expert Iro Lua Oguntuashi. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Yes, um, good morning and thanks for having me. Good I morning. hope you bought your salary ram because I'm ready to buy mine. <laughs> I mean, if you hear the price of uh, salar or ram these days, it, it, I think everyone is probably going to use chicken this, uh, this uh, uh, salar. Um, Even chicken is very expensive. Oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we're going. We're going. We're going. We're going vegan uh, this time. I'll I'll celebrate with my friends that I've bought. I'll celebrate Salah with them. Okay, all right, then. that's a good way. To anyway, go. let's get into the conversation. There's the, I, I first of all want to get your thoughts on the whole back and forth. You know, labor has its demands. The federal government has its points um, that it will cause mass retrenchment. Well, organized private sector also, you know, might be arguing seemingly in favor. You know, al um, alongside the uh, federal government. What what's your view on these arguments? Well, um, my, my humble view is that at a particular point in time during this put, parties must be able to find a point of resolution, a point of mediation, or a point of conciliation, as the case may be. Because the purpose of trade disputes is we would all come together to find a point, you know, whereby the dispute can be resolved. Um, at this juncture, I would like to appeal to Labour to also approach it with the mind of settlement. You know, while I also appeal to the federal government to, to approach this with the mind of settlement, they must create equality, you know, in bargaining. There is something that is called equality in collective bargaining. It is an imaginary table whereby Labour is sitting on one side, the federal government is sitting on the other side, the organized private sector is also sitting on the other side. Now, it should be assumed that all of them are equal, that is, there is equality. And as such, this will enable and engender them to be able to sit at the table, you know, to resolve this. The reason I'm saying this is because, you know, on one hand, this thing, I'm saying it as a game of parts or so, you know, so to speak. One person may be thinking, or one party, so to speak, may be thinking that, well, I, I'm more powerful um, the, 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 than you. But in this situation, you know, when two elephants fight, or when three elephants fight, the grass would definitely suffer. You know, that's the point I'm saying this. So they shouldn't see it as if um, a fight to finish. They should see it as a fight for development. If they see it as that, I believe that all the parties will be able to shit their sword and also come to an agreement. On the part of the federal government, I've said it several times, that any negotiation or any agreement that you're trying to make, it must be scientific, it must be based on proof. You cannot just come and say that, okay, um, we cannot pay 60,000, or we cannot pay 62,000, or we cannot pay 100,000. On what basis are we saying that the federal government cannot pay this amount? Let's not forget that the citizens over time, the labor over time, have seen the bloated government. The labor over time have seen the way people in the government spend money. You know, the money that belongs to the citizens and to the detriment of the citizens. I believe that is one of the basis upon which labor may be canvassing the high point of minimum wage. But at this juncture, a lot of waters have gone under the bridge. I think it's high time parties came together in order to finally resolve this issue. And they must be very open, they must be very consensual, and they must know that in all of this, it is only the poor citizens of Nigeria, the masses of Nigeria, that should win. When you say that it's about time that parties come together, the parties have been coming together over and over again. I mean, we've been seeing the numbers go from, everybody's been shifting grounds. They've been shifting their ask and their demands. Where would you say would be the fair place for the parties to stay? Currently stands at 250,000 from Labour and 62,000 naira from the federal government. So where would you say would be a fair place for parties to meet? Now, when I say the parties come together, let me start at that point. I mean sincerity. I mean consensuousness. In all fairness, on the part of the federal government, have I seen sincerity? It is my humble opinion. No, I have not. Because Labour has shifted ground substantially, no doubt. But on the part of the federal government, apart from shifting ground, have they been able to provide a reason, a basis? And I'm not only saying to the Labour alone, to the citizens of Nigeria, because 
this this trade dispute is also the public opinion is on the side of labor if we were to look at it or we were to take a percentage poll and that's why parties coming together mean that the federal government must be sincere in saying that okay this is what we have on ground this is the budget from this budget this is the expenses that we usually do on salary this is the proposed revenue this is the proposed expenditure the increase that you are asking for how is it going to dip into the budget how is it going to affect the expenditure such that we may not have planned for it that is one of the sincerity that the federal government needs to show and this is extremely important now relating to a fair point in which parties may meet for me i've always said it anything above hundred thousand is fine for me hundred thousand one one thousand is fine for me but in addition to all this the federal government has said something which is very important and what they are saying is that even if we increase minimum wage would that be the solution so that means that a lot of responsibility also lie in the hands of federal government to ensure that all the indices and parameters that have caused inflation are curbed because labor are also looking at the high rate of inflation and is on the premise of this that they are conversing the amount on minimum wage so that the poor citizens will not suffer because i tell you the poor citizens are suffering already look at the amount that we used to buy electricity tariff i've said this on this program before that gone are the days whereby with my 5,000, I will buy 64 units. Now with your 5,000, I buy 22 units. You know, there is high rate of discrimination by A, band B, band C, band D. When is the responsibility of the federal government, you know, so to speak, government to provide social welfare, which includes electricity. So these are the indices that the federal government needs to look at, needs to look at so that even in the wake of the increase in the minimum wage, it will still not amount to nothing. Yeah. I mean, there's also those who argue that Labour needs to change its approach or change its demands. Um, that instead of asking for um, an increase in minimum wage, they maybe should be making demands that the federal government does all it, it can do to reduce the cost of living, reduce inflation, um, reduce the price of electricity, reduce the price of petrol, reduce the price of you know food um, foodstuffs in, in the market and all of that. That that maybe would make things a lot easier for Nigerians and we wouldn't need to you know, continue to demand an increment in minimum wage. Because unfortunately, if you look at Nigeria's you know, trajectory, economic tra trajectory since 2015, everything just keeps going up. You know, there's, there's never been a time when we've had a reduction in inflation you know, you know, back to back for a six month period. It just keeps getting worse. Maybe, of course, maybe government, when governments come into power saying they want to continue where this person stopped, it just keeps getting worse. So, Instead of making the demand to increase the minimum wage from 100,000, in a couple of months, it might be demanded, ask for 180,000. Should Labour then be making demands for, to reduce the cost of living instead? Yes, I agree with you. Labour should make demands to reduce the cost of living. But to what extent would they be able to achieve it? I mean the federal government. And within what period of time would they be able to achieve it? I'm saying this because if we look at the situation that the citizens are now, I'm part of the citizens, you are part of the citizens. People are at their lowest ebb. There is increase in the wave of crime as a result of all this. People are at their lowest ebb. So when you look at this, there must be something that will come into cushion. Now, there has also been a distrust. I also want us to look at it from that perspective. You know, when before all this inflation started, when subsidy was removed, the promise was that there will be palliatives. Have you seen the palliatives? No. Have you seen all the things that the federal government and the state government promised that they would do, apart from the minimum wage um, demand, you know, or the minimum wage access of 35000 so to speak? Apart from that, we've not seen any other thing. I think that's the angle in which Labour and Nigerians are also looking at it. I agree totally that there should also be, Labour should also converse for the parameters that have increased inflation to be reduced. But in addition, what the citizens of Nigeria are yearning for is just a quick response, a response in such a way that it will, in a little effect, pushing the rate of inflation and also give them a sort of soft landing. Have they been able to get that? I don't think so. Again, I said, this is my personal opinion. I don't think so. So in as much as Labour is conversing that, there is something that is called development administration. Development administration is a situation whereby the people that are the end of a Yes, you know, they will try as much as possible to identify the challenges on one hand and try as much as possible to, you know, pushing it in such a way that it will not really affect the citizens such that 
you know, the government can develop, the citizens can also develop with the government. Are we seeing that now? No, we are not seeing it. So those are the issues. I believe the reason labor is conversing for this increase in minimum wage, apart from the fact that it's even over five years, is because of this high rate of inflation. Let's look at something. Before, um, when labor started this struggle, federal government was yet to increase electricity tariff. Immediately, federal government increased electricity tariff. It now serves as a sort of impetus for labor to also jack up their proposal to 615. So these are the things that, that these are the things that we should be looking out for. So I don't believe that at this juncture that the federal government should not increase minimum wage. The federal government needs to increase minimum wage while at the same time they try to achieve you know, all the parameters, even without labor even conversing that, okay, electricity tariff must, must, must go down, all the parameters of inflation must go down. It is the responsibility of the federal government to, to, to look at it and ensure that all these things go down. Because the federal government, they are in government, this administration, they are in government to cater for the yearnings of the citizen. And that is the provision that is contained in Chapter 2 of the Constitution, Social Objective, Economic Objective, Educational right. Objective. Right. With all due respect, I don't able to achieve all these things. I don't think so. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're not the only one who has, you know, similar thoughts. You know, not very many people have any faith in the current administration to achieve, you know, the reduction in the, in the cost of living, you know, that many people demand. But we'll see. Nigerians have elasticity that, you know, you, you cannot um, um, uh, break. Um, no matter how bad it gets, there's always space for it to get worse. Um, Iraluwa Oguntuashi, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, we enjoyed speaking with you, and of course, happy um, public holidays next week. The pleasure speaking with you too. Have a <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, stay with us this morning. Uh, the conversations continue this morning away from the national, uh, the Nigerian Labour Congress uh, conversation. Let's talk a little bit more about the National Association of Nigerian Students. That comes up right next. The National Association of Nigerian Students, NANS, on Thursday rejected a bill proposing a single six-year term for the president and state governors, calling it anti-democratic and an attempt to limit citizens' choices. The bill introduced by 35 houses of representative members under the Reformed Minded Legislators Group also suggests rotating the presidency among the six geopolitical zones to reduce governance costs. NANS, however, urged Nigerians, pro-democracy groups, organized labor, and trade unions to mobilize against the bill. The national clerk of the Senate uh, of the National uh, um, Association of Nigerian Students, um, um, Yakini Adewale, warned that if passed, the bill would undermine accountability, transparency, and responsibility among political leaders. He emphasized that eliminating the possibility of a second term would discourage good governance and enable leaders to focus on personal gains. NANS threatened to organize nation nationwide student protests to oppose the bill and protect democratic principles. Now, joining us is legal practitioner Ibukun Fasomi. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Good morning and good morning, viewers at home. Great to have you on the program. Let's first of all get your thoughts on this new bill. Do you share similar concerns with the Association of Nigerian Students? Well, I do not. The position of the Nigerian students calling for a protest against that bill. For them, they have their reasons for coming against that bill, alleging that such will prevent good governance and uh, stifle the people or the masses. I hold a different opinion. A uh, six year single tenure for executive office of the president and the governor would bring to board and to bear some sincerity in terms of governance. And this is what I mean. If you look at the past, our recent past, you will realize, and agree with me, that most of our executive governors and the past presidents we had have this urge to return for a second time, alleging that four years is not enough 
to do whatever it is they intended or wanted to do. By reason of that, they focus on governance and halfway into the first term, they're already preparing for the second term. And we know what politics is about in Nigeria. It means compromise here and there. It means going all out. It means campaigns. It means strategic networking, even at times at the expense of the people and the dividends of democracy. So if we now have a single tenor of six years, the idea of politicizing the 50, uh, let me say half of their tenor will no longer be there. Then the idea of people coming on board with exactly what they intend to do will be there. Then the idea of over monetizing everything. Let us not deceive ourselves as a nation. Huge funds and and the uh, part of finances meant for good governance are divested and moved, deployed into politics and politicking by governors, by president, whose aim is to return back to office. So if we look at the bill, I think we should read into the merits of the bill. Let us not, uh, away from sentiments, away from whatever the politician, no politician would like this idea because everybody wants to perpetuate themselves in power. But we must try to ensure that the interest of the people, the interest of the nation is supreme. What is it that the person wants to do that he will not be able to do at least start in six years? There is nothing. I want to also know that government is a continuum. If you can't finish it, some other people will pick it up and complete your term of or project. And I want, I want Nigerians to see the good in the bill. The people that pro proposed the bill gave us a number of reasons. And I agreed. If you look at the manner, the way and manner our politicians go about their issues, you will realize that we need, as a nation, to be able to call our leaders to account. And once you are done with your one time, go and sit down. Let someone else come on board. The idea of second term, the idea of electionary campaigns while in office, the idea of incumbency power in selection of uh, candidates in primaries, all of these things have in the past overheated our politics. It has relegated a democracy in political parties, and it is really affecting a nation. All so, right. For me, without really belaboring the matter for that, national, national Association of Nigerian Students may have, you know, had uh, this reason to come up with their own decision, but I challenge them. Let them go deep into the bill. Let them just oppose. Let there be a debate about this issue. And I tell you, some of them will give reasons. They will, they will agree with reasons that simple diatenum is, is going to be a very good one for the nation. All but right, now the question let's look at some other aspects of this. Let's look at some other aspects of this uh, proposed bill. They're not just talking about the single six-year tenure. They're also looking at the rotation of the executive functions, executive powers of the president and the state governors to the six geopolitical zones. They're also looking at, they're furthering the conversation about the autonomy of the local government. And they're looking at conducting elections on the same day. So we are struggling a little with um, being able to conduct free, fair, credible elections here in Nigeria, where we've seen what happened in 2023 elections. We now have off-cycle elections. Why? Because we're seeing that a number of cases go to court and we're, we're in court for months, even whilst maybe some other people have been sworn into office. Do you see the possibility? Let's look at you know the, the area of conducting all the elections on the same day. Do you see that happening? Do you see how we maybe are ready or not ready for that? Well, on the issue of uh, conducting election on the same day across the nation, you know, for good students of history, you recall what happened and why we now have off-circuit elections. And let us also not forget that it's a constitutional tenor, that is, four years. So for us to have that, I do not see that coming up now. Maybe we may, as a nation, begin to plan towards it. But I don't see that happening now because how do you explain that to those people in office who are yet to complete their four-year term. We may likely think out with the constitution, but there would not there would be there would, there would have to have a, a kind of interim because there will be an interregnum. For those off circle elections now, like Ekiti, Ondo, Edo, those people are not sure the election will be held this year and next year. 
to complete a four-year tenure as stated by the constitution. And for the general election, which will be coming up in 2027, so for us to unify and codify all to become the same, there will definitely be a need for amendment so that there will be a constitutional provision for that interregnum to unify the conduct of election across the country state of Nigeria. But as we speak, that is still not possible until we have been able to amend our constitution to bring that to form. Yeah, all right. Um, I, I, I maybe would even have a different argument entirely. Um, um, and I, I would like that you, you know, let me know what you think about this. There's the argument that the conversation about a six-year tenure or four-year tenure is a distraction. It's a waste of time. And the reason is, it is deceitful believing that there's a lot of Nigerian politicians who are trying to be governors or presidents and will be able to achieve all possible levels of growth and development in six years. Um, we've seen time and time again that even eight years is not enough for these people to be failures. When they are going to be ineffective, if you like give them 200 years as governor, they would fail. Shouldn't we as a people and the National Association of Nigerian Students and every other civil society be pushing for a system or to, to, to fix our systems and every system of government, fix our institutions in a way that they can checkmate every single person who holds political office, fix our state houses of assembly so that if a governor is there for four years, and in fact, in his first year, if he already is ineffective, there's already a vote of no, no confidence and he is kicked out of office. Shouldn't that be the focus that we should have? Because again, an ineffective governor or president will be ineffective even if you give him 20 years in office. So the time frame isn't necessarily the problem here. It is the fact that we have weak institutions that do not urge these persons to do the work that they've been elected for. Do you agree with that? Well, I, to a large extent, I would agree with you that we should strengthen our institutions. But that question clearly bothers on what we call separation of power and the rule of law. The purpose and the aims of uh, Montesquieu, when he propounded the theory of separation of power, is that each arm of government would act as a check on the other, thereby creating what they call check and balance. If a governor or president is incompetent or is not performing optimally, it is the duty of this other hand of government, particularly the, 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 the parliament, to call such executive governor or president to order. Nigerians, we have donated our rights, so to speak, to the people representing us, either at the National Assembly or the State House of Assembly. And the duty of those people who have the avalanche of our rights of avalanche of our voices is to project it at the floor of the parliament, either the lower house or the senate. And we must understand that when all of these things happen, the bulk of the war lies and stops at the table of our representatives. I tell people, you cannot be speaking with, your, uh, with, two, with, with the two sides of your mouth. You cannot, at a point, elect a senator and as of rep member, and at the same time you are speaking you, you know, you, your voice, so to speak, has been donated to those people. It is those people that will go ahead and project it. But the challenge we have is that where the people elected to represent us have abandoned their primary responsibility of representing us, there comes the problem as a nation. I will not agree, I, I agree with you on the issue of when a person is not performing well, and uh, you will be in office for six years, and nobody will be able to call them to order. That, to me, is an indication of a weak institution. If the National Assembly cannot call the national the president to order, or the House of Assembly cannot call the governor to order, it shows that the House is weak. So, as a nation, we should begin to call our representatives to account. We should call our representatives to make sure that they do their duties and uh, of the obligations. They are not there as we go ahead. They are representing us. And our voices should be heard to them because we are practicing a democracy and there's a social contract theory. Whereas all Nigerians 
one way or the other, we have delegated, donated, and given, given our rights out to people right. to represent us. So, in this circumstance, I believe that NANs and Nigerians should now focus their attention on their representatives and also to ensure that they do the bidding of Nigerians. Not just sit down in Abuja and begin to say, they are, say what is convenient for them. They must try to, rep, to, 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 to represent us and reflect. All right, Mr. Fasomi. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you've made you know, your points. Um, Nance, I wish you know, we, we would have some time to even speak with the um, representatives of the National Association of Nigerian Students because I would also like to question them. You know, I know exactly you know, how they've also fared you know, as an association, how relevant they've been in the last couple of years in conversations concerning students, you know, which they should represent. Um, Ibuku Fasomi, thank you very much for stopping by. We would love to speak with you again. Thank you Have for your time. Have a pleasure. beautiful day ahead. All right. All right. All right. Um, uh, and of course, you know, the, you know, just the points that I made earlier, you know, um, it's, it's really bold, you know, to be having those thoughts, uh, you know, as a Nigerian, that a governor, knowing that he has only six years to work, you know, will put in all the work. Um, there's many governors and many examples of states across Nigeria where if you had given those people, you know, 100 years as governor, they would fail for those 100 years. The problem that I see is that we do not have any institutions that checkmate these people. The people who have robbed Abia State, for example, of hundreds of billions of naira in the times that they were governors in Abia State. If you gave those people, I mean, I don't even need to call names, if you gave those people 100 years in office as governors of, the, of that state, they will fail for those hundred years. All right. There's those, just no institutions. There's no state house of assembly. There's no level of government that checkmates them. So, so maybe they should be checkmate. They should reduce it to four, four years single tenure as opposed to six years single tenure. Would that be better? Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just want strong institutions. That's, that's I what agree. I want. All right. Speaking of uh, institutions, of course, we know that the court is a very key role, plays a key role in ensuring that we have stronger institutions. A federal high court in Kano has affirmed its jurisdiction to hear a human rights violation case found by the dethroned emir of Kano, Aminu Adu Bayero, and senior counselor Aminu Dan Agudi regarding the reinstatement of Emir Mohammed Sanusi II. The court issued an ex parte order preventing Governor Abba Yusuf of Kano from reinstating Sanusi until the substantive suit is resolved. This order also challenged the abolishment of four emirates, Michi, Gaia, Karai, and Rano. Justice Lehman emphasized the need for all parties to maintain the status quo. He stated that the Federal High Court has jurisdiction over the case based on Section 42, Subsection 1 of the Constitution. The judge adjourned the case to June 14, 2024, highlighting the matter's sensitivity. And that's the update regarding uh, the emirship. And as we get further updates, we sure will bring you that on Breakfast Central. Now, let's take you through the stories we've discussed this morning to share with you a quick recap. This morning, the federal government threatens mass sacking as Labour disowns agreement. We had a quick conversation about that. And also, the National Association of Nigerian Students rejects single six-year anti-democratic bill. We just spoke with Erolua Fasomi on that one. Or Ibuku Fasomi, I beg your pardon. The Supreme Court reserves rule in, in local government autonomy. Uh, we had um, our reporter uh, bring us the re updates on that report. But that's not all this morning. I'll share with you what's coming up next in the second half of Breakfast Central. Coming up next, we have the top stories of the week. A lot has happened, and we get to share with you what our top stories this week are. And we still will be talking about celebrating Men's Health Month. Men, it's important for you to prioritize your health. We'll be opening the front, uh, looking at the front pages of the newspaper and opening the phone line. So please get ready to call in then. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. Now let's take you through the big stories on the front pages of our newspapers. And just to mention that you can be a part of this section, please do well to call. The numbers to call will be on the TV screen. We'll be delving into the conversations this morning with public affairs analyst Theophilos Akatuba. Good morning. Thank you yeah, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be morning, here. Thanks, All right. Let's begin a conversation this morning by looking at the Daily Independent newspaper and what the front page of the Daily Independent has to offer. 30 die from 1,141 cases as disease spreads to 96 local government areas and 30 states. And if you're wondering what the disease is, the disease is cholera. Please, everyone, be safe. Be careful. There's a cholera outbreak as much as you can. You know, ensure that you cook your food at home. I've decided that for now I will not be eating out. I like to eat out a lot, but eating out can wait. Uh, we also have the um, sub-stories there. 
First anniversary Senate list achievements passes 25 legislations, um, reaches 115 resolutions. That's uh, one of the big stories there. We also still have on the front page of the newspaper, brace up for um, brace up for adjudication, CGN, NIJ, or um, thank you very much, CGN, NJI administrator tasks judges. Yes, it's the council's adjournment of Yahya Bello, um, his case, and that's um, a case that a number of Nigerians are looking at to see exactly what happens. Local and foreign mafia tried sabotaging our $19 billion refinery, according to Dan Gute. Supreme Court reserves judgment on suit seeking local government autonomy. Emirship tussle, no Dubai in Kano during Idel Kabir, police declare. Tinubu names here address former advisor Tanimu Yakubu as DG Budget Office. And Aviation Ministry in Dilemma over naming substantive NCAA DG. Suspended DG NCAA in limbo, according to source. Najomo still in acting capacity NCAA. Kiamo will address gap aid. At the top of the paper, we have Rousey Session Mass National Assembly probe of $4.451 billion NLNG Project 7. And World Cup updates, NFF to hire foreign technical advisor for Super Eagles. Now, in case you're wondering what's happening on the front page, there's a big photo there. Uh, congratulations. We can see Major General Abdul Salam Abubakar, General Officer Commanding uh, 3rd Armor Division of the Nigerian Army. And uh, we also have the New Central MD here. This was, of course, he was being given an award. And if you've not been aware, New Central has been conducting a uh, uh, a town hall in Plateau State to hear the people. It's not enough to just read about the stories, but we want to be able to connect to the people one on one to find out what it is they're going through, to find out what the stories that haven't made it to mainstream media are, and how the government can step in, how we can step in as well. So New Central has been that has been that voice for the people in Plateau State. So yes, that's our MD over there, Mr. Kaede Akintemi. And that's all that we have on the front page of the uh, Daily Independent newspaper. Let's move over to this Nigeria newspaper. All right. On this Nigeria today, uh, we can see on the screen there, rising inflation, adulterated foods, flooding Nigerian markets, uh, FCC uh, PC warns, Idel Kabir, uh, scarcity of pepper and tomatoes hits Ilori markets. I'm not sure how people are going to celebrate um, on Monday and Tuesday or over the weekend also. Um, Ohanez raises concern over OB OT feud on Democracy Day. I'm not sure exactly what feud they are speaking about. Um, Nigeria's banking sector loses 14.71 billion naira in four years to fraud, says S.B. Morgan. God chose Tinubu as Nigeria's first progressive president, says Oshoba. Wow, I didn't know that God is an INEC officer. He is, actually. Mm, that's um, nice. Troops kill 197 terrorists, nab 310 in Zamfara and Abia. Lagos GDP records 50% growth on the, my watch, says Songwulu. Those are the big stories on this Nigeria. Let's quickly stop over on the Vanguard, see what we can find over there and um, bring in our guests. On the front page of the Vanguard newspaper, um, hardship, labor kicks as 20 states deny workers wage award. Uh, minimum wage, we'll pay what we can aff afford, Tinumbu says. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not looking very funny anymore. Uh, so makers, okay, no, that's not... Promises to send executive bill to National Assembly says fall at Eagle Square is idobale for democracy. That is prostration for democracy. Senate passed 25 legislations, 150, 115 resolutions in one year, according to the Senate leader. NCDC alerts and cholera outbreak. NFF moved to salvage Super Eagles World Cup chances to appoint a boss for Finidi. At the top of the paper, Sanusi, how I want to be remembered as Emir of Kano. Um, State of the nation, there's hunger, new anthem, not priority, according to Mackinley. Local government autonomy, Supreme Court reserves judgment on federal government suit against 36 governors. Motorcycle import rises to 200 and rises 205 percent, that is to 73.59 billion naira. These are the stories this morning on the front page of the newspaper. Let's start with um, local government autonomy and uh, the Supreme Court reserving judgment on that. We're seeing uh, the federal gov government has taken these 36 state governors to court asking that the section, section se 7 of the constitution be implemented regarding the autonomy of the local government. State governors are kicking back. It doesn't seem like they like the idea of this. And I'd like you to talk about this some more. All right. Uh, thank you. I think this matter uh, is a very broad uh, matter. 
And it's very good that uh, the federal government decided to have what you call a constitutional interpretation and ask the Supreme Court to make a final determination of this matter. However, if you look at the construct of the Constitution, the central government, at, is a, a, from what I see when they were thinking about they wanted to have an idea and, and to control even the state by sending money directly to the local government. In a federating unit, you're supposed to have two tiers, whereas every state is supposed to determine how to delineate its own state for convenience of administration. We're not supposed to have uh, the local government enshrined in our constitution as it is. And so that was a kind of military thought of a unitary form of government under a federal system. And so the governors are opposing it, and the governors have not found it interesting. That's why you see that even elections to local government are simply appointments. Unfortunately for Nigeria, Nigerians are always agitating for federal reforms, for federal so But even at the state, you don't have that form of agitation. Nigerians don't see states as units that can stand on their own, and you can actually fight the fight of democratic, so, uh, democratic entrenchment. What we see is that the governor simply appoints whoever they wish uh, to local government and the accounts and the monies are given to the states and the state shares them. It's, it's, it's been a mess. And so they've not been able to implement the constitution the way it should be. All governors, many of them are guilty. Even under Buhari, when he signed an executive order, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the APC governors took him to court and defeated him. But, but, but the, the thing <laughs> is, you know, the, the argument the state governors have is not because of what you've described now. It's not because, you know, the military is... Um, idea behind creating that uh, yeah. um, constitution. It, th theirs is just selfishness. No. It's really because just they, because they want control. Their argument in, in court, if they have a strong argument, is not any of these things. No, no, I understand. There. I'm only giving you something at the background why we yeah. created a system that is difficult to implement. Why did we get here? How did we get here? Yeah. How did we even form a constitution that is very difficult to implement where those who are supposed to implement it are opposing it? It's because the intention ab initio is faulty. Because in a federating unit, you have two tiers. And you should have two tiers, state and the federal. And the state governor, just like Tinubu did when he formed the LCDAs, and Obasanjo withheld the funds, is in line with the fact that Tinubu's opinion and thought is that you can't let me have the same number of local government continually and forever with a uh, Kanu state that doesn't have the same kind of density of population. And my population is growing exponentially. I've got to create units of for effective administration. Obasan just said, no, the constitution must be obeyed. And you know what happened. What happened was Obasan withheld funds to local government for many years. He argues against that. He says that's not exactly, that's not what happened. But Who, who's arguing? Obasan yeah. Well, every, everybody's arguing, but I'm just saying that. How, why did he withhold the funds? Why didn't he release the funds to the, to the local government, at least the 20 that's recognized by government? What I'm trying to say is this. There should be a final resolution to the matter. And now that the judgment has been reserved, I'm waiting anxiously to the resolution. Governors are always afraid of having 20 local governments under them, and half of those local governments will be in the hands of the opposition. It's a very difficult thing to, for them at that level. And they also forget, they demand the same of the federal government. They want to be in opposition, states that are given the free chance to reign. And you can't even allow that in your small unit. So it's not about breaking Nigeria into smaller units. It's about the attitude of Nigerians, not wanting to be opposed or not want, not able to have the patience and the tolerance to cope with opposition. Power I mean, the, the, the attitude of Nigerians or the attitude of Nigerian leaders, leaders it's politicians, not, uh, Nigerians, not leaders. Nigerians make their leaders, and there's yeah. no leadership that came out of an alien nation. There's the leadership is from the people. If the people are defective, you find it in the leadership. Well, um, it's, it's a conversation we would expand, you know, upon. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see where this case goes. I like, you know, I personally like the fact that the AGF is challenging it. Yeah. Um, and I would like to see where, you know, what, how they eventually rule. Let's talk about Yahya Bello. Um, information, of course, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I think he didn't show up at court yesterday. Um, but, of course, the ruling or the story here on the, on the Daily Independent um, also speaks. It says, um, oh, I can't find the story anymore. But the story on the Supreme Court, basically, on the Delhi Independent this morning on Yaya Bello's case. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how it is currently? Yes, it says EFCC Council seeks adjournment of Yaya Bello's case. What are your thoughts on how the case is currently being handled? Um, I remember that the EFCC chairman, um, um, Oluko Ede, did make promises to Nigerians. I think he said he wants he would, be, he, would, he would resign or he would something like that if you know, he doesn't get to the end of this case. 
What are your thoughts on how it's currently being handled? First, the statement of the chairman is an evidence that he might not be able to do the case. Number two, he doesn't need to promise anybody his resignation. He's, he's supposed to resign if he's not able to do his job. And Yabelo should not be the only pointer to that fact. So that's one. Number two, I'm, I was embarrassed to hear that the EFCC chair, uh, uh, legal person is the one asking for adjournment. This is a case that you have been ready for all this time. For you to be the one asking for it is an embarrassment. So it shows that there are a lot of under, under current that's going on, activities. Yeah, 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 will not want to sleep. They want to do everything to upturn the case and twist the AFCC. And I can see that already playing out. Okay. Um, let's talk about a, a, an unfortunate situation that we seem to find ourselves in whilst we're battling with the inflation that has hit 40 percent whilst uh, we're talking about the fact that idel kabir is around the corner a number of people cannot even afford to buy rams and celebrate as they should celebrate we're seeing here that adulterated foods are flooding nigerian markets yeah it's if uh, the standard organization of nigeria and all of those agencies should hold themselves responsible and we cannot afford to so uh, endanger our citizens um, with the porosity. Just, just to quickly interject, yes. please. As you are talk, saying, talking about this, they are saying FCC, PC ones. Who are they warning? I, they, I don't understand. They, they, they should deal with the agencies that have allowed this food to get into the system. We didn't create the standard organization as an agency for a mere show or decoration. They are to protect us from substandard goods of all kinds and ensure that the right products are in the country. And if they are in the country, you don't warn us. You go after those you think and the source they have come in through. Enough of government officials sitting in offices demanding for high, high pay, uh, all, the, like, all the pecks of office, and not doing what they should do. It's very expensive to run the country, and it's at our cost. Today, the, co the country, uh, citizens are reeling in high cost of living as a result of saving government from collapsing. And who is government? The very people we pay on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this, this Sanders Organization of Nigeria, FCCPC, NAVDAC, the, all of them. They're, they're corporate. Yeah. You know, and for, for me, one of the things that I've, I've noticed that we lack in Nigeria is consequences of failure. Absolutely. So, so, so the, the, first of all, there's not even any standard that you, you know, that you use in rating how well these organizations have performed. And so when they fail, you know, there's, there's nobody checkmating them, not on the state level or on the federal level. Nobody, you know, would question the reason for these adulterated goods flooding the market and, you know, question customs um, and, um, um, and um, the uh, and NAFDAQ also. We're really just going to read these stories and move on and have these people remain in office. But well, it's a different story entirely. L let's also talk about um, something that is on the... Um, Vanga this morning, and I'm, I'm going to extend the conversation. It says here, marking the state of the nation, there is hunger. New anthem, not priority. Um, so I want you know to extend it into the new portrait of Mr. President, the world record portrait, and of course you know the conversation that surrounded the whole of Democracy Day. It seemed to have been clouded by the Mr. President's you know you know tripping um, and falling. There wasn't really a lot of conversation concerning actual Democracy Day. First of all, uh, the national anthem is not a priority. I agree with him. But it's something that we need, that the president, in his uh, wisdom, and whom we have given our mandate, consider that um, he wants to hear his citizens say the very things that he feels that they should aspire to, that he believes as a leader who has been a politician, believe that we've not been united enough to arise to the call of a nation. So he believes that uh, we did, for 40-something years, we've been arising as compatriots but we are not united and we have not even recognized our differences and that we must work together. But it's not, is it because of the anthem? Uh, the anthem could have been part of it. In terms of who, what is an anthem, it calls us to certain nationalism. When you hear the national anthem, especially outside of this country, you feel the impact of it. I think the national anthem, the, 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 the arise of compact as a person, is not, it's a very soulless anthem. It's a very combative, military-like anthem, calling people to battle, to fight for a nation. I agree. But this one is calling us to first unite before the battle, to yeah. understand. So I support the change, but the Mackinder's opinion, I agree with him. There are many priorities in Nigeria. The hunger of the citizens 
can be politicized. And I don't want Nigerians to keep playing politics with the hunger of the citizens because Nigerians have always been hungry. Do, do you think that maybe it should have been, you know, a proper deliberation about this before the anthem was changed? No, no, no. There's no need for that. There was not. What was done was legal. They went through the processes. You see, it's not a new anthem that's just been scripted. It's something we use for 18 years. So returning it back it doesn't need all those elaborate opposition and argument. After all, it's not a priority, so why do we waste our time? So what if in 2027 the new president comes in and then reverses back to our rise of that's, 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 that's the implication of democracy and having a leader. You have to accept that whoever you give your mandate will direct the nation to where it should be, not necessarily what you think it should, because you gave your mandate to him. A leader takes people to where they should, to where they are supposed to be for their growth, even when they do not understand <laughs> Anyway, let's not drag this down for too long. Because I mean, because you, know, you can also even criticize the those who have criticized the new anthem, the new okay, the old the, Nigeria will hear the anthem, yeah. right? And they've criticized certain, the use of certain words like what native, native. No, land. no, no, native is uh, it's um, a, it's a it's somebody that's over academically uh, looking at a word and trying to find the derogation around it. The native is not a negative word. It's not bad. It's, it shows about a location of a people, people who are together in a location. Dictionary meanings, have, I've looked at it everywhere, and it's not the way native, native is not negative. OK, so now the it's second part. It's not as negative as they want to. OK, let's look at the second part of the conversation some, that Osage brought up. Some said the... motherland, too, and that should have been fatherland. Yes, the motherland is because God Almighty is the father of nations, and Nigeria is a mother. And now we are here as a mother, we pray to our father. <laughs> so that is simple. Nigeria is, is a female <laughs> in the scheme of God yeah. looking at the world. And the anthem is a prayer to God. I like that part. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. it's actually, I, I, I used to oppose it until I looked deeply into it. I used to oppose Ghana when they said motherland. Now I understood that a prayer of a national people is of living in their motherland towards God, their father. Okay, so the second part of Osage's question was talking about the portrait, the largest yeah, Guinness I was shocked, record breaking portrait. Yeah. I was shocked portrait. to see that. And I, I was a bit worried because uh, it, it just, it, it, I, I was a bit worried because it, should, it looked a bit like some of those small nations in Africa where their leader is over publicized and their leader becomes the banner of the nation. And uh, I was really surprised. Uh, however, I looked at it, what day was it? Was it the, the independence day? No, but it was the democracy day. And every politician seems to have uh, alluded to Tinubu's role during the struggle. And maybe, maybe uh, that day appeared to be where Tinubu had the chance to project his image as also one of the fighters of democracy. Uh, during his speech, he made elaborate announcement of a uh, listing of those who fought. Yes. For he also was a titan of that battle. So I, I thought since it was democracy day, he wanted to put his name, but I was a bit worried about Well, it. in his defense, maybe I would say that he wasn't the one who came up with the idea. There were 37 artists. Someone had the project, and there were 37 artists to represent the 36 states and the federal government. They have the desire to sell this and feed 250,000 Nigerians from, from June up until October, giving them 50,000 Naira every month. These are their hopes, their plans regarding this. However, there are those who have criticized the state Sorry, in that... Look, look, let's, let's, let's x-ray that. Uh, 250,000. I don't know how, how they plan to do it, because I'm just but like... Why should that be the discussion right I, now? I, I'm just looking at the portrait, what it stood for, because all the good intention behind it. Yeah, they asked, because they yeah, asked There's him, always a good thing around it. They asked it. him, What's, what, why, why did you do this? And he said... The oh, president. No, no, not the president. There's a, 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 an Okbayemi guy. I, I believe that's his name. I'll double-check his why name. Why did he do a portrait? Everybody wants to do anything. So it was spectacular. It's a good idea, but the point is, what does it represent for Nigeria? So, so when, if we go back to 2018, our Democracy Day wasn't always June 12th. Our Democracy Day was May 29th. That was Obasanjo's just yes. infusing May 29th. And then, yeah. and then when President, Bom, uh, President Muhammad Buhari then declared that June in 12th. honor of oh. MKO oh. Abiola, June 12th be May Democracy Day. Shouldn't that maybe have then been, I mean, that was the argument we saw a lot portrait on social of media. A portrait of MKO. Being that that's the only election that Nigeria can say so far. We can say we all unanimously agreed on as the freest yeah. and the first election. I agree with you, but you see, like I said before, a politician, Otinubu has an ambition as a person. Obafemi Olowo is a leader of the Southwest. Tinubu is also towering himself towards that credential. 
And you, he will use every opportunity he has also to project himself in the scheme of the democratic struggle. Now, MK Abiola's image would have been appropriate. However, Tinubu believes that MKO has played his part, he's been honored adequately because all of those de decisions Buhari took were not without the input of Tinubu and those who believe strongly about the June 12th. And so you must understand. So for him to have permitted this, it means that he also wants to be in that. You don't think he was self-seeking? Uh, it could be self-seeking, however. I'm not looking at Nigeria now. Everybody seek for self, really. But you don't want him to also seek for self when the opportunity comes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think we spent too much time talking about that. You know, I'll share my thoughts on that one on a later date. Let's go to, um, or let's take a quick break. When we come back, we would look at the punch and um, also share with you what stories are over there. Men's mental health is a critical yet often overlooked issue that requires greater attention and support. Societal pressures and traditional gender norms often discourage men from seeking help or from openly discussing their struggles, leading to an underreporting and untreated mental health condition. It is essential to break the narratives surrounding men's mental health, encourage open conversations, promote emotional vulnerability, and provide accessible resources and support systems tailored to men's unique uh, needs. Now, joining us this morning is a mental health expert. Yes, we do have our mental health expert. You've seen her before, but it's a pleasure to have her join us again. We have Dr. Bonjumola Babalola. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's talk about how important it is for us to have a um, conversation about Men's Mental Health, Men's Mental Health Month, and where we are in terms of the attention that men get regarding their mental health. All right. Well, thank you for spotlighting and actually having me in the studio to talk about it largely because a lot of focus is usually on women and children at the detriment of men. But what we're coming to realize over time is that men suffer too, men struggle too, but people rarely talk about it. You know, like in your introduction, you had said it's an overlooked issue. But it doesn't mean that men don't have problems. Men have a lot of problems. Men have mental health problems. And even though they don't like to talk about it, they don't like to admit it, they don't like to get help for it, it doesn't make it, you know, nonetheless of an issue. Uh, the Men's Mental Health Month, like we've rightly, we rightly know, is June. And it's a time to draw attention, not just to the plight of men as regards their mental health, but to also encourage them to seek support. Because men would rather, you know, wait till the end, either by taking their own lives or deciding that, you know, it's, I can't do anything for myself anymore. And so let me see what best I can do for my mental health. Over time, of course, a lot of issues affect men's mental health. Issues like employment issues, relationship issues, financial issues, and of course, issues that have to do with, you know, issues affecting their ego and all of that. So men suffer too, men struggle too, and it's important that we shine the spotlight on men. How do we strike a balance between those who believe, because um, I've seen this a, a few times, people who say, well, it's men's mental health. If men aren't championing it, then, you know, whatever. You know, why, why should society care if you, who is a man, is not even championing you men's mental health? Same thing with, you know, the International Day of the Boy, boy Child, mm -hmm. which I complained about. Um, what do you think, you know, the conversation around that should be if men, you just said it now that a lot of men, you know, shy away from talking about it, you know, until it gets too late. They don't seek help. They don't, you know, even mention anything. So if that is already the norm, should we then encourage more men to talk about it or should society generally just accept it that it's a concern that must be spoken about regardless of how eager men are to speak about it? Also, we, as we as society have failed over time, and it's largely, you know, driven by the norms of the society. The fact that, oh, you hear things like men don't cry, men shouldn't show emotions, men are being too sensitive, you should man up, and, you know, but, <laughs> and I see that look on your face, you should man up, and um, somehow men have learned, consciously and unconsciously, to put, to put their own needs and their own, you know, wants at, at the back seat as regards when you have women and children, put the women and children first. Men, a man can always, you know, take care of himself. But what has happened is that we've, we've seen men crumble under pressure. Yeah. Sometimes it's not even a lot of pressure. Sometimes it's just, you know, simple day-to-day, -day, um, normal stresses, traffic, um, arguments, you know, in traffic, arguments in, in, work <laughs> in workplace, aggression, and all of that. So it's our collective responsibility. We can't say because men are not doing it for themselves that we should not do it for them. 
we can encourage more men to talk about their mental health. And, you know, in encouraging more men to talk about their mental health, it's also important to create enabling environments because it's not just enough to say, talk to me now. Yeah. If you talk to me and I'm invalidating or judging you immediately, you're talking to me, then, of course, it defeats and deflates the entire topic. So beyond asking men to, you know, be on the forefront, and a lot more men are doing that, being on the forefront, even though, you know, quite a number of men are still put down when, you know, they come out and say, oh, we won't talk about the boy child, we won't talk about men, but... It shouldn't deter men. Men should continue to, you know, put in the work. And of course, men should be supported by the women who love them as well. And I'm glad that you highlighted that. So let's talk about how women can support them. What are some of the things that we can do? Women and then as a society in general, yes. because I see that sometimes on, when you go on social media, you read the comment section and post where people are being vulnerable. You will see them that if a man decided to be vulnerable, in the same breath, while some people are saying to him, oh, I applaud you, you're strong, thank you for sharing your story, there will be other people who are tearing him down and saying, oh, God, man up, why are you there crying? Like, we see comments like, why are you crying? Like a woman, mm. because his emotions have been, have been made a gender-specific thing. Mm. So how do women support men more? And how can we as a society, especially even on social media, be kinder to men and encourage them to share more? Also, first off, we need to see men as humans, not machines. We also need to see vulnerability as strength, not you know, frailty, not weakness or anything. We need to create enabling environments. And so beyond being, you know, being informed that, oh, this is a man, he has emotions too, and he can show his emotions in different ways as he may decide, we must also be responsive to them. And so when they do speak to us, we must you know, respond in kind, compassionate, and non-judgmental manners. Um, it takes a man a lot to speak to anyone. You know, I have a couple of friends who are male, and it's not the first time you talk to them that they would open up to you. It's not the second time. It's not the third time. It's consistency. And so we need to be patient with the process. Just because, you know, a woman would open up, you know, cry on your shoulder, want a hug almost immediately, doesn't mean a man will do almost the same thing. And so we need to be patient with the process for men. I would, of course, always want to talk about what I know as the four L's, encouraging men to talk. The first thing is that we need to learn about men's mental health. There's something like men's mental health, and so we need to be curious and be informed and educated about it. Number two, we need to listen. Listen in a kind, compassionate, and non-judgmental manner. When they speak to us, let us validate them. It's okay. It's okay to cry. It's okay to... It's okay. Just open up. The third thing is that, of course, we need to look out for them. And so let's look out for the men in our lives, the ones we love, the ones we work with, the ones we interact with every now and then. Let's start to notice the changes, either subtle or large. So subtle isolating, withdrawing, not wanting to talk to people, extreme, drinking ex excessive alcohol, becoming physically or you know, verbally aggressive, things that they would not normally do from time to time. And then, of course, the last is that we must link them up with sources of support. You will tell them, I know someone you can talk to. I can follow you. I can support you on this journey. You don't have to do it alone. So again, learn about mental health. Listen to them in a kind, compassionate, and non-judgmental manner. Um, link them up with sources of support. And of course, look out for them as well. I uh, just, you know, want to quickly mention that I may not be showing up at work on Monday. <laughs> my, my mental wow, health is it's in, in advance. My mental health is in shambles, and I, I need to kill myself. Yeah. And that's how, I mean, that's how offices need to support men's mental health also. Understand the times that we're stressed out mentally, and we can't show up at work on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. <laughs> You, you just want to week. add to the salad for yes. the day. Yes, the whole of next, right. next week. And maybe next week morning because <laughs> Sunday evenings are really depressing. You know. Um, yeah. But I, I, let's, let's talk, talk about it you know, um, in the Nigerian context. The Nigerian wife. How does the Nigerian wife um, understand the concept of men's mental health and support her husband? All right, so I, I think that's a very interesting question. And I was thinking about it when I was coming here this morning. You know, a few years ago, I had managed a patient who became depressed. The female became depressed. And when we had this family session, the, her mother said something very instructive. She said um, she had always in, instructed her daughter not to support her husband, that it is a man's job to do this, to do this, to do this. And even if you see him bending under pressure, don't help him. Because if you help him, he will feel like he's full and he will you know, go and start looking for babes outside and all that. And I looked at the woman, wow. Part of why the, you know, the young lady had been admitted was yes. because... Her husband actually struggled. He struggled with work. He struggled with finances. And even though she had, because of, you know, what her mother had handed down to her. So there are narratives that are being handed down to people that are largely destructive. Yes, there have been, you know, narratives about men in the past, but not all men are like that. And of course, like, you know, Olive also said, we need to show men kindness. Just because one man had done something in a certain way doesn't mean that all men will do it. And so I think that women need to be more patient, more tolerant, 
more allowing and more understanding of the man that they're with. It is not a man's, it is not solely a man's responsibility to shoulder so much. Yes, he's the provider and over time he sees himself as, you know, the superman, not wanting to drop the ball at any point. But if you see that your man, you don't even have to wait till he struggles. Have conversations about, you know, what the house looks like, what income looks like, which is why a lot of men don't even tell their wives what they earn, because they feel like, oh, when the, once the woman knows, she just sits down and doesn't want to do anything. So I think that women, Nigerian wives, should see their husbands from a wider lens. Don't place a judgment on him based on what you heard. Individualize your man, understand your man, and support your man. He will not take you for granted. Respect is reciprocal. I'm glad that you actually case. mentioned this scenario of a patient whose parents had handed her yeah. those harmful thought processes. Yeah. Do you think that our generation is perpetrating the same cycle? And I ask this because now we're becoming more aware of certain things. We're seeing that uh, I would think that a number of parents are starting to treat people, prioritize both children. Yes. But when we're growing up, I think that there was a lot of focus on women. Women's, uh, women being sexually abused, yeah. and we didn't see a lot of conversations about men being sexually abused. So when we women came together, a number of us would share experiences, and when we shared experiences, you see, according to WHO, one in three women have been abused. I think that statistic is outdated, by the way. But more men have been sexually abused as well, but I don't think that they talk about it yeah. enough. So do you think that we are correcting the mistakes of our parents in terms of prioritizing the male child in how we, in how we raise children? I don't think you could have said it any better. And yes, a lot more attention is being given to the male gender as compared with only or solely the female gender. And so a lot of conversation is you know, in on around those topics. So for instance, I have a male child. And I say to him, he comes to me and he says, I love you, mommy. You're the best mommy in the whole wide world, almost, you know, 10 times a day. When, he, when he's emotional, he cries. And I say, it's okay to cry. So, again, starting from the home, not asking them to bottle up emotions, not asking them to dismiss how they're feeling, not making them feel like, you know, they're inferior because, you know, they're a certain way. They're supposed to be a certain way to women. That's where the conversation should start. Again, environments and society should be more allowing, allowing of conversations around men. You talk about our generation. Our generation is, as I almost said, we're woke. We're more informed and we're more educated and we have more, you know, we're more empowered to be able to deal with these issues as compared with prior generations. And so I hope that we will do better. Because what has happened to the generations before ours is that we see broken men. We see men who are hurt because nobody helps them. Nobody listened to them, first of all, and nobody helped them to tend to the needs that they had in those days. As quickly as you can, because we, we need to wrap this up, yeah. talk to men who detest the idea of therapy, hmm. who know that they need therapy, but just feel like, ah, I'm not sure I want to share First of all, it's expensive, <laughs> and we have school fees to pay. I know, I know right. it is expensive. But for those who can afford it, yeah. but just don't want to explore the idea of therapy because it seems like a very foreign Western idea, concept. So, dear men, please open up. Please talk to us. Um, therapy may seem expensive. However, at the end of the day, the benefits that you get are listless. If you don't speak to your trauma or handle your own trauma, what you'd find is that you'd keep handing down trauma to the next generation. We understand that you struggle. We understand that there's a lot of pressure. But please, find someone that you can trust to speak to. Thank you. No better way to wrap up the conversation about men's mental health and mental well-being other than that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bojumola Babalola. It's always a pleasure to have you speaking about mental health conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks All for right. Uh, it's time for us to wrap up the show, but we will share what our top stories of the week are. If I'm allowed, can I, can I be allowed to choose a top story that we haven't yet discussed, but I think is a top story? Mm, yes. You're asking me Thank now? you. So okay. my top story of the week would be in celebration of International Sickle Cell Day. I think that a number of people, a lot more people, need to talk about sickle cell, talk about the importance of people knowing their genotype before getting married. Yes, there is technology now and their invention to be able to circumvent having sickle cell children, even though those are debatable based on culture and religion. But I think that we need to have more conversation about sickle cell. There are people who are hurting and dying. We need more research to be able to explore how we can make life better for those who are currently living with sickle cell and to encourage the donation of blood. So as much as you can, please. It's even healthy for you. Donate blood because it will save a life. It would help someone who's living with sickle cell live a better quality of life. And if you're wondering, you know, you don't know where to start from, you can reach out to the Sickle Cell Foundation or Hima Health. 
And uh, that's my top story for the week. My um, top story for the, uh, this week, I think I'm going to speak on, you know, something, I mean, it came up today, actually. But it is with the conversations concerning a six year, single six year tenure, or, um, you know, to continue with the current format, which is uh, four years uh, twice, you know, of course, leading to eight years. And like I argued earlier, it really doesn't matter how many years you give incompetent people. You can give a you know, competent person two years and they will make, they will do magic as governors. They will increase IGR, they will increase agriculture, they will fix education, fix security, you know, and all of that on different levels of governance. You can also give an incompetent person 40 years and he will achieve absolutely nothing. That is not the challenge and I feel it's a distraction. You know, members of the National Assembly who are debating this should be told that you know, it is a distraction. What we should be focused on is fixing the institutions of government that checkmate failure. Um, if we have state houses of assembly or the National Assembly that truly checkmates and keeps these people on their toes, it would ensure that they do not fail um, in the time that they are in office. If we have a state house of assembly that cautions a governor or checkmates a governor when he's mismanaging funds or when he's failing in his responsibilities as governor, it would be on his toes. Um, and if we have these institutions of government, the Auditor General's office and every other you know, agency of government that should keep these people on their toes, it will reduce the failures of these people in government. We've had too many times in different states and in different parts of the country, look at northern Nigeria, it's a complete mess. But these people have had governors you know, for decades, governors that you know, would eventually award themselves hundreds of millions of Naira in pensions after four years of failure. But the reason is they do not have institutions of government checkmates in their minds. So that's what we should fix. The time frame of government is, is not the problem. 400 years as governor would, you know, would be useless 400 years if you have an incompetent person who is not checkmated. Those are my thoughts. And uh, this is um, where we, of course, will be wrapping up this Yeah, morning. before we wrap up, I also want to share, since I shared this top story that hasn't yet uh, happened, that uh, World Sickle Cell Day is June 19th. Today is World Blood Donor Day. But uh, my own top story would be NLC and the government. And I'm hoping that the tripartite organization can reach an agreement. 250,000, 62,000 naira. There's just this back and forth. And at the end of the day, the Nigerian workers are the ones who have to bear the brunt of this drama. So I'd like to please urge the government to look within and to ensure that they prioritize the wants and the needs of the Nigerian worker. We need to come back to the negotiation table and once and for all reach a conclusion as to what exactly the minimum wage will be. Prioritizing the current reality and then, you know, ensuring that we actually now start to see the government cutting costs on their own end. It's not enough to say we cannot afford it. But if you cannot afford it, we need to see that you're making effort to cut down the costs so that the, gov so that the people can feel like we're all tightening our own belt from the, from the government to the citizen. And that is my top story for the day. As I wrap up, my reminder to you once again, dear people, today is World Blood Donor Day. Thank you to all those who have donated. And we look forward to having more people donate to save lives. Like I said earlier, if you don't know where to start from, visit Hyma Health on social media and they can help you. And that uh, concludes our, our plan for today, our show for today. We'll be back again next week. Remember that Breakfast Extra continues this weekend, so you can keep up with the number of these stories on Saturday and on Sunday with Breakfast Extra. Until we come your way again, I know it's Friday and we're all going to have fun. I like to say do not drink and drive. Make sure to turn up with sense. I am Olive Emodi. And I am Osalgi Ogbawa. See you next week. Bye-bye.